See him? I think it's best to leave him and let the authorities tend to the body. You mean to investigate? Yes, an investigation. Which will undoubtedly confirm the cause of death. <laughs> well, that's not suspicious at all. Hello, Internet. I'm Ren, and today I want to take a look at A Murder at the End of the World and give my thoughts on the first two episodes, Palm Fatale and The Silver Doe, both of which aired on November 14th of this year. I really enjoyed both episodes, and I'm surprised to see almost no one talking about this show, so let's get into it. This is going to be a generally spoiler-free review, so no worries if you haven't seen the episodes yet. I love a good mystery, and A Murder at the End of the World wastes no time in drawing us into two different murder mysteries unfolding concurrently in the past and present. Our main sleuth, Darby Hart, introduces us to the mystery in the past at a reading for her book, The Silver Doe. I sometimes wonder, would it have been better not to go? Maybe I could have made better choices, but I couldn't have made them then. It's really hard to fall in love for the first time while tracking a serial killer. And her book reading itself sparks the events that unfold in the present. I saw that you dedicated the book to Lee Anderson, the hacker. Why? When I was growing up, she was one of the only female coders around. You know, until they doxed her and destroyed her life. Through flashbacks, we find out Darby grew up tagging along with her father, a coroner, to various crime and death scenes. Yeah, we'll talk about that more later. The subject of Darby's book is her hunt for a suspected serial killer after being on the scene when police uncovered the skeletal remains of an unidentified woman with nothing but a pair of intricate silver earrings buried with her. In the present, after the reading, Darby is invited to a luxurious, all-expense-paid retreat to an undisclosed location by a mysterious tech billionaire, Andy Ronson. I'm here on Andy Ronson's behalf to invite you to his 2023 retreat, a small gathering of minds. Or rather, his adorable AI assistant, Ray. Side note, I love this whole sequence where Ray pretends to knock on her door and come up to her apartment. Hello, Darby. How nice to finally meet you. Aren't you going to invite me in? It's so cute. Although, this exchange is a bit weird. You won't be lonely on the retreat. It's an impressive gathering. I'm sure you'll find the other attendees of the retreat just as fascinating as Lisa Simpson. Ray reminds me a lot of Poe in Altered Carbon. I am not a bell boy. I provide counsel and security for a very intrepid human. And I love him. Andy's introduced me to things that have left me speechless too. <laughs> yeah, like what? Vivaldi's Spring. Beyonce. <laughs> the collected works of Borges. The television program The Simpsons. Darby agrees to go in the hopes of meeting one of her heroes, Lee Anderson. Uh, will Lee Anderson be there? Of course. Your work is of great interest to both Lee and Andy. A prominent but seemingly seclusive hacker who also happens to be Ronson's wife. But I think she got the better of them, you know? What do you mean? Well, she married Andy Ronson, you know, the king of tech. Next thing we know, Darby is boarding a private jet with the other guests. It's the uh, standard consent form. I'll be doing a quick temperature check to board. And a mouth swap. There's a fun little sequence where we meet them all. One thing that's interesting here is Darby takes some pills from another passenger, Lou May, to knock her out because she doesn't like flying. Can I have some of whatever you got? Knock yourself out. And later, she takes some pills someone offers her to help put her to sleep after she watches someone die. Both times, she chooses to avoid difficult experiences rather than process them. I'm not sure if I'm reading too much into it, but I think it actually tells us a lot about Darby as a character and how she deals with things. Or doesn't. They arrive at their destination, and it's revealed that it is Iceland. And they're staying at this very Icelandic-looking hotel that Ronson has constructed that also seems to double as some kind of future rich guy prepper bunker. Now, you're the first people to stay in this hotel, and the reason that I built it is because I believe we're in one of the last true great areas of wilderness left. Oh yeah, the titular end of the world is mostly in the form of climate anxiety so far, which like, fair. By the time this little one is 18, this planet that we call home could be past the point of no return. Everything seems to be going okay, until Darby's ex-boyfriend Bill shows up at the retreat. Hello Darby Hart. Hi, Bill. 
there are definitely some unresolved feelings there. Why'd you leave? You scared me. Jeep. No, I think we both know I could never have been as brave as you needed me to be. But things escalate when one of the guests is murdered. Although the totally not suspicious at all rich guy insists it was an overdose or an intentional act by the decedent. Then let the authorities turn to the body. You mean to investigate? Yes, an investigation. Which will undoubtedly confirm the cause of death. I think this group is no stranger to the fact that our most brilliant minds are often our most fragile. From the get-go, this show seems to have a lot in common with another criminally underrated miniseries on Hulu that I enjoyed. Devs. Like, listen, both series feature a wiry, short-haired woman in tech who won't stop sleuthing after someone turns up dead, a shady billionaire who is almost definitely involved, although this billionaire is no Nick Offerman, an enjoyably pretentious, meditative, art housey tone, and beautiful aesthetics. Okay, there's even an enigmatic blonde who functions as the billionaire's right hand, although I don't want to imply that Murder at the End of the World doesn't have its own identity. It does. For example, the first episode starts us off by framing the story with this statistic almost immediately. There are 40,000 unidentified dead in the United States. Around half of those are thought to be accidental deaths, but the other half are unsolved murders. Like the Jane Doe that turned up on the edge of my town. Which helps us understand Darby's drive and tenacity to find justice for the unidentified dead. When I was 15, I hacked the federal database of the unidentified dead. And the great secret behind that firewall is that the majority of the unnamed dead are women. I also really like that A Murder at the End of the World seems to be a murder mystery very intentionally written to subvert the copaganda element that tends to run through the genre. Darby isn't a cop, and whenever we see her interacting with them, it's clear they really don't have much interest in getting justice for these missing women. And no wallet, no ID. Nope, just those, Sherlock. And a hole in her skull. Man, you don't think it's strange that these are the only things with their body? Girls wear earrings. So Darby is forced to go through alternative channels, which is how she meets Bill on an amateur sleuthing forum, and they both get to work looking for the killer of Silver Doe. Darby's name for the Jane Doe that was the subject of her book. A reviewer in the narrative refers to Darby as the Gen Z Sherlock Holmes. I know who you are. <laughs> Did you know LA Times called her Gen Z Sherlock Holmes? which does come off a bit silly, but we do get to see her observational skills and deductive reasoning in action. And there is a certain Holmesiness to it that is really fun to watch. We also get to see all the forensic skills she picked up from spending her childhood hanging around crime and death scenes with her dad while he examined bodies. This bit is absolutely wild, though. She walks past so many cops in this scene, for example, and no one's like, oh, hey, maybe this young child shouldn't be here until she's literally standing right next to a corpse. Jesus, you brought your kid? It's okay. She's not hurting anything. Like, bro. Later on, we see that when she was in high school, her dad actually allowed her to assist with the autopsies. And the evidence, which definitely doesn't seem legal or wise, but does give Darby a very particular set of skills. That said, it definitely adds some interest to the character and gives her an excuse to have bizarrely specific knowledge for crime solving. She's also a hacker, another thing she has in common with the main character in Devs. It's not my favorite part of the story. As I said in my House of Usher video, a lot of writers without that background struggle to make tech characters sound believable. The cameras here are wireless. They're on their own VLAN. Footage of every door's camera is flying invisibly through the air, through your body, through my body right now. Although I would say the hacking elements are better written than some in terms of believability. Hey, Ray. Yes, Darby. How can I help you? Do the numbers 04142017 have any significance for Andy Ronson? April 14th, 2017. Zoomer Anderson Ronson's birth date. You know, as someone who knows nothing at all about hacking and hasn't coded anything since high school. And it does allow her to do all of the investigating as sort of a one-woman machine, so it's fine. I admit I find the narrative in the past more compelling so far than the one in the present, even though the crime in the present is more directly impactful to Darby since she's present for the immediate aftermath and more personally involved. So we should technically be more invested in that storyline, but the story I'm really interested in, the one that drew me in, is the Silver Doe. Who is she? Where did the earrings come from? What happened to her? 
The present day story feels more like Glass Onion, but it gets tangled up in a mixture of commentary on wealth. Well, I'm morally against this kind of wealth, but I've admired his art, his, his work for so many years, and when I heard he was coming, I couldn't not accept the invitation, and that's how these assholes get you. Climate change. Margaret Atwood said in an article that the nearer we get to the climate crisis, the fewer choices we have, but we still have some, and we have to start making them. AI. But not good art, not art from the soul, not the kind of art we need. But Ray isn't an artist. Ray is a tool artists can use. And true crime. You know, I always worried that there was something like cheap about what we did together. We're like, salacious but that was stupid that you wanted to make sure no one fell through the cracks some of which works i thought the book was art some of which doesn't but ray ray he's read all of shakespeare tony morrison <laughs> and stephen king he's watched every single movie ever made ray is better than i'll ever be because ray is better studied it's trying to do a lot at once, resulting in the pacing in the first two episodes hitting a snag here and there. And I just don't care about any of these rich people, even though I do find the mystery and premise interesting enough to keep watching them. But it's like when you're reading a book that's written from multiple perspectives, right? Like Game of Thrones. And it's a Danny chapter, and you're totally engrossed. And then you turn the page, and the next chapter is fucking Bran. Like, okay, I'll sit through it, I'll enjoy it as much as I can, but I am just killing time until I can get back to the story I'm actually interested in. Maybe the Iceland side of things will pick up more, but even if it doesn't, I'm interested enough in the Silver Doe storyline to keep watching. Although the modern storyline isn't totally without charm. Some of the characters and their dynamics are interesting, even if I don't really care what happens to most of them. As I said, Ray, the AI, or sorry, alternative intelligence. Some people would refer to him as artificial intelligence. I prefer the term Alternative, Alternative intelligence. intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> is a great addition and so much fun, and I'm interested to see what they do with that character as the series evolves. A Murder at the End of the World is brilliantly acted and directed, and that's true in both timelines. Emma Corrin is wonderful as Darby, and their performance makes the character so engaging that it's easy to overlook some obvious missteps in the writing. I moved like this. Maybe it was fast. Is it ever? What? Fast enough? Don't. I mean, she knew. It's not professional. Such as how Darby naively trusts Andy's pet project Ray to assist her with her investigation while she asks it all sorts of specific questions about her theories. Do right-handed people usually inject themselves into their right arm? Rarely, if ever. The non-dominant arm is the injection site at a rate of 98%. Bingo. Ray? Aren't you the lights in here LED smart bulbs? The recessed ceiling light, yes. And are all the hotel smart devices in the same network? I can't answer that, Darby. But hey, I'm sure that's not going to come back to bite her in the ass. Harris Dixon as Bill is another standout, bringing some much-needed warmth to the character and the series generally. Also, the thing you think of as braving yourself, I'm, I'm not sure that's what it is. What is it then? Clive Owen as Andy and Britt Martling as Lee are also solid, and their cast of eccentric and wealthy guests is really fun. I particularly like Martin, played by Jermaine Fowler. Maybe Andy loves him some true crime. You know her book is about her road trip with Fangs, right? You know him. And Joan Chen as Lou May. You hear to sell books? Um, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> no, um, I'm actually here to meet Lee Anderson. Neil Huff is really good as Darby's father as well. They clearly have a complicated relationship. She knew. It's not professional. It's just how I think. I have the paperwork. Can you box the remains up and take her to storage on your way home? A Murder at the End of the World also looks amazing. Lots of beautiful landscape shots in the Iceland timeline, and a very cinematic feel to the whole thing, with beautiful cinematography, lighting, and staging. I really enjoyed the soundtrack for the first two episodes as well. And A Murder at the End of the World certainly succeeds in creating a gorgeous sense of atmosphere. Where it struggles a bit so far is mostly with some uneven writing. While some lines, scenes, and plot elements are clever, 
Others feel a bit clunky or just poorly thought out in comparison. This is like half my brain. You'll get it back. It's so you can enjoy a device-free experience. Like the stuff with Ray I already mentioned, but also with the tech billionaire who is pretty bland in both character and conceit. We've seen this before, and I think Devs, Ex Machina, and many other shows and movies have already tread this ground more effectively. And I'm wondering if this story is going to do anything new with it. His wife, Lee, also feels pretty standard as a brilliant woman seemingly trapped by an evil wealthy dude. Although, there's always a chance they'll subvert that. Lee is the one who sets Darby on the course of hacking into the hotel's security cameras in her investigation of the murder. And I'm not sure her motives are all they seem to be. In the Iceland timeline in particular, the commentary feels a bit hit or miss. Some of it is really solid, but it also feels a bit on the nose at times. And despite the amount of commentary we've gotten so far, the racial disparity in unsolved missing and homicide cases is barely mentioned. Yeah, my assistant gave it to me. For years I've been I've been trying to develop a film about all the missing black women in DC. And while misogyny online and in tech comes up, only the greatest female coder to have ever lived. She wrote this manifesto on how misogyny was destroying the early promise of the internet. They doxed her. So far, the story doesn't dig into it as much as it could, and mostly just mentions it here and there, although that could easily change as we go along. Overall, though, the first two episodes do a great job of setting up the two mysteries, both of which I want answers to, as well as introducing us to a cast of fascinating characters and immersive settings for everything to unfold in. It looks wonderful, the performances are amazing, and the cinematic vibe elevates it beyond its more conventional elements. I think it's definitely worth your time, at least so far. In terms of predictions, I'm wondering if they're going to go the more obvious direction and have Ronson ultimately turn out to be the killer, or if they're going to pull the rug out from under us and it turns out to be his wife Lee behind everything, because I just have a hard time believing it's going to be so straightforward. My other totally unhinged and unlikely theory is that the Iceland murder was actually staged and it's all a mind game of some kind, but I can't decide if I'll be mad about it if it's something off the wall like this. But hey, that's just my opinion. How about yours? Are you watching a murder at the end of the world? What do you think so far? Who do you think done it? Let me know in the comments down below. I'm not sure if I'll be reviewing this series episode by episode yet, or if I'll just check in at the end of the series and give my thoughts. So if you have strong feelings one way or the other, be sure to let me know. Like, share, and subscribe for more videos. See you next time. Vito Sane.